Hello, and we welcome you to our third Surgical Clinics podcast. Surgical Clinics is a bi-monthly publication consisting of review articles devoted to a central topic important to general surgeons. Surgical Clinics has published for over 100 years, and the series and the podcast can be found at www.surgical.theclinics.com. I'm John Vassallo, the managing editor for the series here at Elsevier. And for this podcast, we will be discussing four articles in the June 2022 issue on cardiothoracic surgery. Here to discuss methods of lung cancer resection, management of coronary artery disease, and cardiac dysrhythmias will be our consulting editor of surgical clinics, Dr. Ron Martin, senior surgeon from the Department of General Surgery at Pullman Regional Hospital and Clinic Network in Pullman, Washington. Joining him will be the guest editor of the cardiothoracic surgery issue, Dr. Daniel Quadrado, Chief of Cardiothoracic Surgery at Madigan Army Medical Center at Joint Base Lewis-McChord, Washington. Welcome to both of you, and over to you, Dr. Martin. Thanks, John. I appreciate it. And uh, Daniel, it's so good to see you again, and I miss having the office right next to yours and seeing you every day and (laughs) getting your advice and input. Uh, more than you can imagine. I wish I had you with me, but I know you're better off where you are. Um, Thanks again for doing this issue. It's been really well received and super helpful. Um, And we have four articles we're going to discuss today. And if it's okay with you, I think we'll start out with the two on lung cancer, and then we'll move into the cardiac ones if that uh, meets your approval. Sounds great. Uh, I thought I'd start off with the one on MIS lung resections, minimally invasive stuff. One, it's certainly <clears throat> topical and exciting, but also you're, you're a phenomenal minimally invasive surgeon and robotic surgeon in addition to your other skills. So a uh, couple of things I thought we'd start with that chapter. And, and one is, I think, for the, at least for the general surgeons in the audience, the people that don't do thoracic every day, you know, run us through where we are now with the improved imaging, particularly this ground glass a pacification and how we factor that in and sort of where we're changing our staging and planning based on our ability to get more accurate anatomic information from preoperative imaging for tumors. Yeah. And I think that's a great where to place to start. I mean, when we look at just the management of lung cancer in general, you know, it is only becoming more multidisciplinary, more technology and image assisted. Um, You know, lung cancer screening now is more widely available to most people, Um, even though they say the rates of actual screening in most states are less than 10% of all eligible patients. Um, But with that screening comes finding now small nodules, semi-solid and ground glass nodules. And, you know, these present a particular challenge uh, in terms of how to localize it to the segment. Because what we know, you know, based on the current best evidence, is that for a tumor less than two centimeters, a sublobar resection is equivalent to lobectomy uh, in terms of, uh, you know, oncologic uh, success. Um, you know, even in the lay press, you know, it's, it's written, it was an article today where they said surgeons no longer have to take out a fifth of your lung when you have lung cancer. So when it comes to doing a segmentectomy, obviously it's, it's a detailed understanding of the anatomy um, that's required to, to determine is this lesion, is this tumor in a segment that I can resect. Um, so I think for, you know, for all surgeons, you know, just knowing that, you know, people get CT scans for all kinds of reasons, and not just lung cancer screening, but how we address these small and some solid ground glass tumors, um, it's really referral to a thoracic surgeon. Um, but in terms of the imaging and planning, you know, there are, there is software now that's available that allows us to 3D model the lung um, so that you can actually look at the individual segmental anatomy. So I think those tools are making it much easier for us to plan these cases uh, to the point where anyone with a tumor less than two centimeters, I think really the default should be to plan for a possible segmentectomy. So let, let's, let's follow that up a little bit, because that's one of the other questions I had for you. I mean, you know, if you go back historically, and I've been at this a little longer than you have, we used to focus a lot on the tumor and what we were going to take out. And then particularly liver surgery, and now I think lung, and maybe pancreas to a degree, although you could argue you can take all the pancreas out, so you don't have to worry about it. But we've gotten a lot more to how much you have to leave behind versus what you're going to take out. So so talk to me a little bit about how, how do you recommend we go about figuring out how much lung preservation we need 
and how much functional lung material do we have left based on what we plan to resect? How do, how do we sort through that? Yeah, I think when, when you're confronted with any lung cancer patient, I mean, obviously there's really three factors. There's, you know, the anatomic factors, you know, that, that, that falls into your staging. Where is the tumor itself? There's the physiologic factor of the patient and their comorbidities. Uh, the biggest one for us is their lung function. You know, will we can calculate based on, you know, knowing that there's 19 segments in the lung, how much lung capacity will this patient have after a resection? Um, and then the last part of it is really, you know, where the cancer, the tumor gets a, you know, is it falling in a fissure line or is it against something that makes maybe a segmentectomy contraindicated? So I really think you look at all three of those. Um, but, you know, just because a patient has excellent pulmonary function doesn't necessarily mean we need to take uh, the entire lobe for tumors less than two centimeters. Um, obviously, patients with poor lung function, um, even for tumors larger than two centimeters, a segmentectomy may, is probably still a better option than definitive chemoradiotherapy. So I think, you know, all those, those three factors really fall into play when you're determining, you know, who should get a segmentectomy. But I think the goal, if possible, and oncologically sound should be to preserve as much uh, long as possible. And how do you determine in terms of lung preservation? What's, what's your go-to test? We, you know, we did all kinds of things. We did split image studies with radionuclides. We've done anatomic tests. We've done 3D modeling. Where do you think we are today in terms of assessing the non-involved piece of lung and its functionality and volume? Yeah, I mean, I think obviously the imaging can be very helpful in people with severe emphysema. You know, most emphysema tends to be at the apices. Um, but in terms of hard numbers that we can make decisions off, it's really the pulmonary function test. Um, you know, the Ch American College of Chest Physicians put out very good guidelines to compress and simplify the evaluation. Whereas before, yeah, we would get BQ scans, we would get exercise tests. But now if you have a patient that has a, a post-op resection predicted FEV1, and DLCO greater than 60%, you can proceed right to resection. If either of those is gonna fall between that 30 to 60%, the next test is not anything fancy. It's can they walk up uninterrupted you know, stairs? Um, and it's for the folks that don't meet those criteria, that's when you're looking at a more exotic test, you know, whether it be an exercise test to calculate their VO2 max or mm -hmm. radionucleotide testing if you expect that they may have some reason why lung is not perfused or ventilated that's behind. Well, it's good to know. I mean, it's sort of like when we started doing liver transplant, we just got down to blood grouping, we made it a lot simpler. Okay. Um, and that's, it, it's nice to know that clinical assessment still, still has a place in our world. Um, it does. So let's, let's get into something that you're particularly capable of guiding us. So let's talk a little bit about VATS and robotic assisted thoracic surgery and how do we choose? How do we pick between the two? Does it matter? Um, I think no, I know I, you some of your answers, but I don't want to hear from you. Well, I'm a little bit biased, um, yeah. but, but I will say that, you know, a well-trained VATS lobectomy surgeon um, and a well-trained robotic lobectomy, you know, thoracic surgeon, there's going to be very little dis difference between the, you know, in terms of length of stay, uh, recovery, um, you know, blood transfusion. So that's, that's a really hard thing to tease out and to show. Um, what's more, what, what really, I guess the, the areas where I would maybe argue that a robotic resection uh, is a little bit better than a VATS resection is in a lymph node uh, harvest. I think you, you can definitely get more lymph nodes. Um, I, I think, uh, you know, anecdotally, and there, are, there is some evidence that you get more lymph nodes when you do it robotically as opposed to VATS. The flip side is VATS is much, you know, is cost less. You know, you can get a set of VATS instruments um, and you can use that set over and over again on every case. Um, whereas the robot comes very heavy with, with consumables, um, not just the staplers, but all the other, uh, you know, cannulas and consumable instruments. Which one's easier to teach? I think the robot is easier to teach. Um, and, I, and I think the reason why, if you have a dual console, um, you can very easily and seamlessly pass the case between the resident and the, and, and the staff. Whereas with VATS, it really depends on what side of the patient you're standing, because there is some work that needs to be done from the back. There is some work that needs to be done from the front, which was the bulk of the resection. So, you know, it's hard to mirror image your mind to teach that. 
Whereas with the robot, it's, it's as seamless as, hey, you can start off by using these two hands, I'll run the third hand. Um, and then eventually you get them to doing the entire operation themselves. Mm -hmm. The other nice thing with the robot is you have a stop, you know, if you hit the camera pedal, every movement stops. So you almost have the brakes you can put on if someone's kind of delving a little boldly into areas they shouldn't. So I do think the robot is, and especially with a dual console system, is much easier to teach um, than it is VATS. I think you're right. And having helped some people out with single console robotic stuff, it is really hard to help somebody without the other console. Um, oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I think I think you're right. For teaching mechanisms, I think the dual console and especially the more advanced robots are certainly the way to go. The stop pedal is the greatest okay. thing ever. And also, the, our residents are coming out of their general surgery training better on the robot than, you know, someone like me who learned it five years after fellowship. So... They are. Uh, where we may be struggling is the other side, which we're about to get into, is yeah, we will. on That's... the open side of the coin. <laughs> so yeah. speaking of which, let's move a little bit into the extending resections, which is sort of the other side of the seesaw. You know, great chapter in there. And I think as we started out with the minimally invasive part, let's think a little bit about the anatomy, because the way it looks like it's breaking out to me, you, you tell me if I've got this wrong, is we've really got low-grade T tumors, one and two, that have bad nodal involvement. We've got T3, T4 tumors without necessarily nodal involvement. And then we've got tumors that are involving other structures, some nastier and some less nasty. Those are the big candidates as far as I see it for the extended sections. Does that sound like a reasonable breakdown to you? I think absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So now, so walk us a little bit about, let, let's start out with smaller tumors, but bad mediastinal nodal involvement, which, what's your process there? So I think, um, you know, and it was discussed in one of the other chapters, I think the trend that we're going to see very similar to rectal cancer and other cancers is that we are going to start giving neoadjuvant chemotherapy, immunotherapy, or a combination of the two for much earlier stage disease. Um, because we are, you know, it's, 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 it's biologically different having, you know, nodal spread um, than having just an isolated tumor that happens to be growing into a rib. So that, that patient needs systemic treatment. And, and I think there's a good argument that with immunotherapy in particular, your immune system is never as strong as it is before your operation. Um, so I, I think that we're going to see more and more of that. But I, I definitely, I, I really enjoyed this chapter because it's a cautionary tale that not all tumors can be taken out with small poke hole incisions. And, you know, for folks who are in charge of teaching, that's a challenge. You know, how do I, how do I, in a two to three year fellowship, take someone, uh, a trained general surgeon and teach them how to do everything from robotic segmentectomy to, you know, on bypass resection of the aorta, you know, and reconstruction of the heart. So, I mean, that's, that's a challenge. You don't say, yeah. That's, <laughs> so, no, I'm with you. And I mean, and I think that's, that's, a, you know, we've, We've gone, you know, if you go back into the 80s and 90s when I trained, where the advanced skill set was to learn how to put it in a trocar for a laparoscope, nobody had ever done it. I mean, that's where we were to now where we have a point where almost everything is done or can be done videoscopically. I mean, obviously, there's a handful of exceptions, but <clears throat> but the comfort level of people coming out of training, I'd say in their first decade right now, they have always trained in the videoscopic era. Yes. And with possibly the exception of people that do military work like you and, and I used to, where you go to a place where it's all open um, yeah. for various reasons. Um, we're really seeing a diminishing group of people that are comfortable with large incision or medium sized incision operations. Not because they can't make yeah. an incision, but because they're just totally unused to the approach and the visualization. And yeah, again, I think it's, you know, it's the generation of surgeons that, put their hand down to feel, uh, as opposed to and even my generation where I put my eyes down to see, um, you know, I, I, uh, you know, and I know yeah. we've talked about this before, but, you know, look at how many papers are written on subtotal cholecystectomy. Um, and unfortunately for cancer, there is no, you know, you have to get it all out or, you know, eventually you're going to have, if you don't have that skill set, send it to someone who knows, um, because not everything can be taken care of through a minimally invasive approach. Yeah. Ironically with the gallbladder, you frequently really should get it all out too. We can talk to the exceptions to those rules, but they're becoming, it's becoming an exception in this case that's built not because it's the better operation, 
because somebody's just not comfortable with the options to go yeah. down the road. And I think in your case, you know, in, in lung cancer, as with, you know, pancreatic and biliary tumors, sort of my side of the world, you got to get an R0 resection. If you're not, you have. if you're not, yeah, that, that's it. I mean, you got to do what you got to do or, or don't do it, you know, go yes. a different route. But there's no such of a thing as a half of an R0 resection. Yeah. It, and the tumor always gets a say. I mean, you know, you can go in there, plan A, I'm going to go in and I'm going to do, you know, an apical segmentectomy. And oh my gosh, this is invading the ASIC, this is invading the SVC. That happens. And, you know, you, you have to have those skills to be able to jump from one to the other. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about that. I mean, or the, the, other, the other two parts of this chapter I wanted to get into was one, these extended resection, and the other is sort of the sleeve resections and the bronchoplastic stuff. And so do you have a preference where we migrate in this yeah, conversation? To I think there? starting with the bronchoplastic, it's kind of a, a natural segue. Um, and and again, the whole premise there is that if you can spare the patient a pneumonectomy, um, if you can do anything short of a pneumonectomy, you should consider that, you know, the, the classic one is, you know, the 20 year old with new onset asthma that has a carcinoid tumor at the orifice of their right upper lobe, you know, yes, a pneumonectomy will take care of that. It definitively take care of that. Um, but you know, a sleeve resection where you cut the main stem bronchus, you cut the bronchus intermedius, remove the tumor and sew the two together. You know, that's, that's a, you, it's hard to argue that that's not a better operation for that patient. Um, more so for people with who are pulmonary cripples that you can't do a pneumonectomy, but yet you can still provide them with all of the benefits of a surgical resection for their lung cancer. No, that's great. So, so tell me a little bit about, you know, cause this is something I have zero experience with other than watching you. But tell me a little bit about the tricks and the, the considerations that you go through when you're setting up to do a potential sleeve resection and bronchoplastic reconstruction. What are the specific things you feel like you have to have your ducks in a row up front? So obviously, you have to know the preoperative imaging. You know, obviously, the, the patient history, physiologic, everything needs to be checked first. But you really have to have a good understanding of the anatomy of where you're going to be working. You know, probably the most common sleeve is the upper lobe sleeve that I talked about. Um, you know, knowing where the pulmonary artery is in relationship to the airway as you're dividing it, you know, knowing um, what maneuvers you can do to release tension, because like, like all anastomoses, uh, tension is the enemy of this, of this procedure. Um, and, you know, an airway anastomosis that doesn't fall apart, that's not something you can put a drain in, you know, that's something that needs to go back in. And oftentimes, you may not be able to redo that anastomosis. So, you know, the techniques to get tension off are, again, a good lymphadenectomy, clearing your lymph node space, your lymph node basin, uh, really setting your field for your, for your suturing. Um, there are times where you'll have to do pericardial release maneuvers. So basically making a U underneath the inferior pulmonary vein to release the pericardium. Um, and, and those are kind of the basic, you know, basic tricks there. Um, but the suturing, it is the same principles as any other anastomosis. You know, you need a good, you know, in this case, airtight anastomosis. Um, and then the final step of that is you should, when possible, buttress that anastomosis with some vascularized tissue, whether it's the pericardium, a flap of pleura, the azagus, um, or an intercostal muscle. Um, so, you know, those, you, you have to really have, it, it's a lot more planning. I mean, the sewing ends up being a circle to a circle. But it's all those things before, after, and, you know, during that are really going to make or break that procedure. Now, I think it may go without saying, but probably for anybody listening to us who doesn't do this every day, the concept of airway management pre, intra-op, and post-op. This is an anastomosis that if you're going to have a problem with it, you need to know what to do. So what, what do you recommend people you know, from, from our anesthesia colleagues to the people who are in the ICU with the patient, or perhaps give us your rundown on airway protection before and during and after this procedure. Yeah. So I think, you know, beforehand, you know, a good bronchoscopy, because if you see, you know, and you should bronch do bronchoscopy on anyone you operate in their lungs, but if you see an aberrant anatomy um, that you didn't pick up on your CT scan, that may totally change your procedure. So the last thing you want to do is get to the point where you're about to cut airway and realize, wow, there's a, this bronchus is coming off a different location. In terms of the intraoperative management of the airway, you know, a double lumen tube is, is, is pretty much required for this type of procedure because in that period of, and, and you must check it before you start dividing the airway, because once you've divided your airway, 
they can't bring the lung up anymore. So, you know, you will not be able to ventilate. So in my practice, I will do a bronchoscopy uh, myself before I commit to cutting the airway. So I have anesthesia check it, I check it, because if you're, if you're looking from the inside, you're, you, you really can't troubleshoot that anymore. Um, Post-operatively, you know, obviously extubation in the OR is extremely important. You know, you want that patient off positive pressure ventilation as soon as possible, ideally in the operating room. Um, but, you know, if, if someone needs CPAP because they are, you know, OSA at home, um, th that's not a downside. I mean, just like with esophageal anastomosis, the data there is pretty clear. You know, you can be on CPAP, BiPAP, whatever you need. Um, and, and it's just really managing, you know, looking for air leaks. And the difference, you know, we all get air leaks from this when you staple lung. An air leak from an airway is not subtle, you know, but that's something you shouldn't leave the OR with. And uh, what sort of instructions do you give the crew who's hanging out at night if this person suddenly turns sideways? That is, you know, that is most of the time it starts with, you know, a, they need to be intubated, their airway needs to be assessed and almost you know, the default is going to be to do all that in the operating room if you can actually ventilate uh, the patient. But if not, it's it's really, you know, asking the anesthesiologist who's there to emergently intubate and main stem over a bronchoscope. Because most most of those major airway dehiscences, that's, that's not something you're going to salvage other than a trip back to the operating room. Sounds good. So let's talk a little bit about sort of the, the chest wall and things that are growing into adjacent structure tumors. I think obviously, you know, the, a, a good thorough staging evaluation. Um, these folks should always be considered for neoadjuvant therapy. Um, you know, whether it be chemo radiotherapy, immunotherapy, immunochemo radiotherapy. I mean, there's there's lots of paths that we can base these on now based on biomarkers. Um, but it's all planning. You know, if, if you're going to resect chest wall, um, you really need to know exactly what ribs are involved. Um, I would, you know, basing it usually on their pretreatment scans too, because you. you it would be it'd be hard pressed to leave behind uh, ribs that the tumor was invading before chemotherapy that is now shrunk down. You know the classic teaching is to remove a rib above and rib, a rib below the involved area, um, and then it's a, a question of reconstruction. You know there's certain places you must reconstruct. So if it's high and posterior, let's say fourth, fifth um, interspace behind the scapula, you know the scapula can sublux underneath the ribs if you don't reconstruct it. If it's in front of the heart, you should reconstruct that as well. Um, I mean, there's, there are, there are several different ways, whether it's Gore-Tex, you know, a methyl methacrylate sandwich, um, their biological plates. Now there's lots of options to do that, but those are things that have to be thought of before you get to the OR. Um, and, and you can really base a lot of that on your preoperative imaging. Um, any room for 3d printing? I think so. Yeah. And, and he, at Madigan, we had a few years ago, a very young four-year-old with a very aggressive, um, sarcoma. Um, and, you know, we just tried it just to see what it would look like. Um, and, and I think, you know, we obviously didn't use it clinically because, the, you know, it's, it really wasn't to scale that we needed, but you definitely could see it. I mean, it would be very nice that you could actually custom order plates um, based on 3D printing. Probably in the future, you'll be able to custom, you know, design your own ribs to replace ribs. Yeah. Um, I mean, that, that, that technology is close. Um, but I think for the preoperative assessment, I, I think it would be nice to show a patient, this is your skeleton. And this is what we're going to do in the OR. Um, and then I'll have that in the OR for my own thought processes. I'm going in about my resection. So I, I think that 3D printing is going to be, and even going back to segmentectomies, I think 3D printing is going to have a huge role in what we do. No, I think you're right. I think that's uh, an exciting opportunity. And I know you've got some great young people there that are have an interest in, in that part of the project. Um, why don't we switch gears a little bit and get over to the, the cardiac side, the heart of the matter? Um, yes, the heart of the matter. And, uh, so, I mean, we've got two parts to cover left. I think if it's okay with you, let's start with coronary artery disease, which my former chairman would have beat me for saying. He would have said it's atherosclerotic coronary artery disease. You didn't just can't call it coronary artery disease like it's inflammation of the head and neck. You know, you've <laughs> got to be specific. But most of it, we're dealing with atherosclerotic disease, although not all. But, but a little bit, I think that a lot of people struggle distinguishing between the acute coronary syndromes and the stable ischemic heart disease and how those are different for both cardiac and non-cardiac surgery to follow. So give us your sort of take on how you feel about those entities and their similarities and differences. Yeah. I mean, again, it's the number one killer in our country. So I think starting off with that, I mean, this is pervasive. 
Um, and I do agree, atherosclerosis is a systemic disease. It, it, the cancer of the blood vessels. Um, but I, I do think that, you know, what, what we have learned and, and what you can see through, you know, really years of really good research is that no matter what pathway these patients go, a patient with ischemic heart disease, medical management is the cornerstone of their treatment. So there is nothing that we can do as either interventional surgeons or interventional cardiologists that, that, can, that can match what good medical management can do for most people. You know, and that's your aspirins, your statins, your, your, um, your ACE inhibitors. Um, they are the cornerstone and bedrock of, of you know, coronary care. Um, I think that, yeah, again, so just, you know, with, with your chronic ischemic heart disease, not everybody needs a stent. Everybody needs good medical management. Not everybody needs a cabbage, but everyone needs good medical management. In terms of the acute coronary syndromes, again, that's something that we do see in the post-op. We, we're not blessed with the opportunity of operating on young, healthy people all the time. Um, and, you know, being able to understand and recognize at least the initial steps, um, which of, 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 you know, someone having an ischemic cardiac event, um, you know, a lot of the patients that you and I take care of are diabetics. They may present with nausea post-op. And that, you know, that in the back of our mind, we should be thinking, you know, this patient is, has the risk factors, you know, we've HMP, they're all the risk factors there for coronary events. We are sometimes stopping part of their medical therapy to do the bigger operations we have to do. So we really have to be aware of, you know, the, the presentation and, and at least the first steps in management before we call in, you know, for our colleagues to come from the cardiology side. Oh, absolutely. So let, let's, I mean, you know, responding to somebody that's having a problem is one thing. And we, t- we tend to focus a lot, like, ACLS and all that stuff is great at responding to something that's going bad, but um, it's always better to head it off at the pass. So when you're thinking about your pre-op eval for cardiac risk factors for either CT surgery, which I think falls into some slightly more modified guidelines, but for non, non-cardiac surgery as well, tell us, you know, where, where do you think we're at with that? I mean, we talked a little about clinical assessment for lung resection. So where do you think we are in the heart world? I mean, I think for, for, let's start with for non-cardiac surgery. So for non-cardiothoracic surgery, I mean, I think that, you know, you get a lot of that from, you know, you know, part of our job, part of the, you know, the, not the magic, the, I guess the, uh, the art of surgery is, is that preoperative assessment, you know, frailty. I mean, we throw that out there. There are several different ways to do it, but a lot of times it's just something, you know, it when you see it, but, but the ways you quantify that are you, you talk to patients, what is your exercise capacity? You know, how far can they walk? Do you have chest pain when you walk? Really kind of the basics of, you know, this is, this is in the get to know you phase with your patient. Um, also then looking at their family history. I mean, again, strong family history is, is a high risk predictor. Um, we, we, patients who already have known coronary artery disease, it's really trying to get that initial gestalt, you know, of, of do I need to get more of an evaluation? And, and I think we do correctly err on asking our medical colleagues to help us in that assessment sometimes. We, you know, we are very focused on, you know, the pancreatic head mass or, you know, the, the fact that someone needs, you know, a, another procedure. Um, so I think that really just, ha- you have to have a low index of su- su- suspicion, but it's really part of the very basic conversation we have when we're trying to gauge the patient's suitability for surgery. Um, for cardiac surgery, Again, most patients come to us for cardiac surgery, everything's done. I mean, they, they have seen their primary care doc. They've seen their cardiologist. They've got a good, you know, a, their heart has been looked at by echocardiogram. Um, they've had, you know, angiography, some assessment of myocardial function. So, you know, that tends to come in more prepackaged. I think the bigger one for most, for all surgeons to know is, you know, how do you, you know, how you just making sure that you ask those questions, you know, that you don't skip over that step because a perfect operation can be, can go completely sideways if there's a coronary event during or after. Always bad form to successfully remove the tumor and kill the patient from an MI. Yeah. That's never usually frowned upon by all. Um, but let's talk, I mean, so, you know, we're going through the workup and, and, you know, things have certainly changed. we got all these, and we find something. We've got evidence of either fixed lesions or something else. And so, you know, we've always got the pharmacologic interventions. We've got performance drugs for hearts that are misbehaving in some way, but not necessarily non-perfused. But let's talk a little bit about the advances in reperfusion, which I think the chapter in your book really does a great job of. And I commend it to anybody. We don't need to relive the whole thing, but, but particularly like, We've got off-pump options now. We've got robotic yeah. options now. We certainly have percutaneous options now. But 
there's a lot more fluidity amongst the team members, I think. But what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I think that, you know, one thing that's very well written about is this heart team approach uh, to, to coronary artery disease. Because as you said, there are so many options. Obviously, medical therapy is the foundation that they're built on. It, it, it really kind of depends because the folks that we're seeing are folks that need an operation. So I think we really need to be familiar with that. I mean, if we have someone that has, you know, an LAD lesion, but has a cancer, um, you know, you really have to have that conversation with the cardiologist because that may change what type of therapy, whether it's a bare metal stent uh, versus yeah. a drug eluting stent, which definitely the dual antiplatelet therapies are different. There are going to be, there are some, you know, disease patterns, you know, that, that, that may need bypass or may need something more advanced. And, and I think, for, for, the, for the surgeon who has a patient with coronary disease that needs additional procedures, you need to be a part of that discussion. You need to be at the table. Um, I do think that the heart team approach to coronary artery disease um, is, is, uh, is, is very important because there are multiple ways to deal with it. Um, one very interesting controversy just over the last year were the latest set of guidelines uh, for the management of coronary artery disease where um, the Society of Thoracic Surgeons didn't sign off on it. I mean, that some of the, some of the uh, recommendations from that group were very percutaneous focused. Um, there was very little input from cardiac surgeons. And without trying to be too controversial, it was based on data that probably wasn't meant to generalize as far as it was. Um, so I, but I do think that, you know, it's important for all surgeons to just to, to, to be a part of that decision-making process, because if you need to take someone's colon out for cancer um, and they have a, a lesion and get a drug eluting stent, um, now you, you're either waiting six months, three months, um, and they're at much higher risk for an instant thrombosis because the drug eluting stents are, are amazing revolutions in medicine. Um, but stopping that dual antiplatelet therapy can be fatal. When a stent goes down, it's a, it's a, you know, transmural MI, you know, it's not, you know, it's not a small event. And, and we general surgeons, I mean, everybody like deals with their problems to eliminate the problem they're responsible for, which is one of the fractionations of, of medical care downsides. It's like the neurologist is super happy the patient didn't have a stroke. And then the general surgeon deals with the person who's bleeding to death because they eroded From some the, ulcer into some visible yeah. vessel. Um, so they, you know, you, and I'm not saying one's right or wrong, but the compartmentalization of our discipline has certainly led people to selectively focus on data that supports the stuff that they do or like. Um, yes. And that's human nature. I'm not throwing stones. I mean, we all, everybody does it. But you do have to look at the whole picture. And if somebody's got a bad tumor that needs to come out and we're going to do something to protect their heart that says you really can't operate on this person for six months or a year, years may be a little long, but six months anyway, <laughs> six months can be a long time for the wrong tumor. You know, Absolutely. papillary cancer of the thyroid, yeah, you can probably sit tight. You know, periampillary adenocarcinoma, the, without some other thing, six months may be the difference between it's coming out or it ain't coming out. Yeah. No, I, I'm with you. And I think one day we'll all get back to having not just heart teams or breast teams or GI teams, but we'll actually go back to having like patient care teams where we'll look yeah, at well, the, the lines are getting blurred right there's gonna there's very difference between me and a pulmonologist or there's less difference between me and a pulmonologist there's less difference between a cardiac surgeon and a cardiologist there's less difference between you know yeah. yourself and a gi physician you're where we just approach things we have more tools um but we're using right. the same tools as well so yeah you, you probably as a cardiac surgeon you probably have a lot more in common on a day-to-day -day basis with cardiology than you do with an orthopedic surgeon. Absolutely. I mean, and it's not wrong. It's just, it's how the game's evolved. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about the, uh, other than non-perfusion, let's talk a little bit about the other things that really go, prob can be problematic in terms of, let's talk about dysrhythmias. I mean, you know, of course, yeah. there's always the only arrhythmia, which is asystole, which is bad, but that's <laughs> generally not one we have to talk about much. You just take measures to deal with it if you can. But AFib, by far and away, most common outpatient arrhythmia, and probably, I mean, you correct me if I'm wrong, probably the most common induced arrhythmia from yes. other interventions. Yeah. And, you know, Dr. Hoff, it was a wonderful chapter 
Um, I, a few, I, I had the good fortune to train under him where they were you know, really starting pioneering some of these hybrid procedures for AFib. But you know, just the burden of healthcare costs, the burden of morbidity in the United States from atrial fibrillation is tremendous. Um, you know, and, and the effects we see are the folks that are on anticoagulation to prevent the risk of stroke associated with atrial fibrillation. So, you know, I, I think that the, the treatment of, of AFib in particular, that is going to be a very rapidly growing field, you know, for the, for the near future. Um, you know, we now have devices that can close the left atrial appendage. Um, and that is where 90% of clot that causes stroke comes from. Um, so you know, let's, let's talk about that for a minute. I mean, yeah. so bring us to, I mean, I know some people have probably heard the words. They've heard of Watchman. They've heard of Clips. There's other proprietary names. There's also you know, operative ligations, but take us a little bit through how, how you think about that, how you would make choices for one versus the next or your thoughts on it. Well, really, I, I think, you know, at a baseline, any patient um, with atrial fibrillation who was undergoing cardiac surgery for any reason, um, that should be considered for an atrial fibrillation procedure, whether it's just uh, ligation, uh, or I'm sorry, uh, radio frequency ablation of the pulmonary veins, which is where most of these arrhythmias originate in, um, and ligation of the late, left atrial appendage, and that should be considered. You know, in cases where we're opening the heart, let's say to do a mitral valve, you know, typically in a patient with atrial fibrillation, they're going to have a maze procedure, um, you know, which is the ablation lines internally in the heart to help disrupt these pathways that atrial fibrillation come by. And a standard part of that operation is to operatively close the left atrial appendage. Again, the source of most, of most clots. Yeah. Um, for folks that aren't having open heart surgery, um, again, I think that we are being more aggressive with treating atrial. Not everyone can be on Coumadin for the rest of their life. You know, and, and, you know, as procedures become more able to be performed in a less invasive way, whether it be a purely catheter ablation um, or versus some kind of combined minimally invasive surgical and catheter ablation, I think those procedures are being considered because, again, it is a significant health burden um, on our population. Um, we talked about the atrial, um, you know, occlusion of the atrial appendage. Again, surgically is an excellent way to do it. If you're inside the heart, you're looking at it. Um, there, you know, when you're outside the heart, again, that, that that's probably some of the reticence to do it because now you're potentially putting another suture line that has a potential of bleeding, um, but operatively mm -hmm. dividing it. Um, the internal devices are very promising, um, you know, especially for someone who's intolerant of, of anticoagulation for like repetitive GI bleeds. Um, the, there, I think those of those devices, the next generations of those devices are really going to, you know, probably have a more su higher success rate. I mean, that one of the downsides to the current percutaneous ways to close the left atrial appendage are, you know, perioprocedural ish complications, um, or, you know, it's not completely occluded and you get recanalization or some type of reflow into the left atrial appendage. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that that appendage is going to be a target of multiple different new techniques and advancements in current techniques to, to occlude. Yeah. But I think as I, as I remember reading, because we looked at this a little bit ago, but, you know, we're looking at numbers well north of 80 percent for non-leak rate into the left atrial appendage. Is that yeah, my correct in that? Yeah, correct. I mean, those are pretty good numbers. And, and you know, you think, I mean, now that people are on DOAX or NOAX predominantly, we really don't know how anticoagulated most of those people are. I mean, we have a general idea. and We can look at giant studies and say maybe a little bit less bleeding complication than warfarin or some drug. We have to measure it and modify it. And, you know, all the downsides of doing lab work and managing this stuff. But, you know, not just the, the bleeding complications per se, but the world is a contact sport. It is. And 80-year-olds and 90-year-olds, it was, I forget which of the politicians it was. It was, I think, one of the congressmen or senators from Michigan before he died. But he said that when you're 90, the entire world is a balance beam. <laughs> um, and there's there's something to be said about that i mean you know you're walking around and you're fully anticoagulated and if every step you got a chance to like fall from a ground height and sustain a bad injury you know not being able to stop bleeding is not an insignificant problem even so you know this big data and i'm all in favor of data but you start parsing it down into smaller populations it may not translate equally well so I think particularly the elderly don't tolerate clotting well and they don't tolerate bleeding well. Yeah. So they live in a narrower range of possibilities. And for, for this group of people in particular, dealing with these issues potentially when they're younger, 
may have a yeah. huge impact on quality of life 10, 15. And I don't think we have a good way to study that yet. No, I, I think there's good data with, you know, on warfarin as to your, your yearly rate risk of bleeding, of major bleeding. Um, I, I don't think we have that with some of the newer, you know, uh, NOACs, um, but it's there. And, you know, how yep. many times if you're covering trauma, um, are you admitting someone with a ground level fall who's on, you know, dual antiplatelet therapy, novel, you know, oral anticoagulation. Um, and that's the, one of the main reasons why they're on it. So it is not, you know, I think ground level falls, it's a trauma, it's a trauma issue as well. So it may be purely subjective, but it seems to me like everybody that comes in who's traumatized either from a fall or a car accident or what have you, who's over 70 that I've seen in the past couple of years is also on an anticoagulant. Yeah. Um, it's, it's almost the exception when they're not. Because those people don't get driven to the hospital. You know, I, you know, I think that's part of it. That's I mean, true. A minor trauma can cause, you know, major intracerebral bleeding or, you know, or bleeding anywhere. Um, you can bleed to death in your thigh from a fall. So yeah, it, uh, this, you know, the elderly on anticoagulation is not a small problem. So let, let's talk a little bit about the actual ablative procedures. I mean, how many people that, I mean, so clearly for somebody who's undergoing a cardiac procedure, if you're going to be in their mediastinum anyway, for whatever reason, certainly if you're going to be intraatrial, that seems pretty much straightforward that there's a way to approach that during the time of the operation, just make it happen. But it seems like in the outside world, and some of this is anecdotal, I think that there's a bunch of people out there on AFib who are waiting and waiting on these long lists to get to see electrophysiologist. Um, do you think that's because we're offering the procedure too much or should we be trying to get our cardiology colleagues to expand their EPS capability to meet demand? Is this a blip? I mean, what do you think? I, I think it's kind of, it's a combo of all of it because look at the population that's there with AFib. I mean, millions and millions of people. So, um, you know, I think that, yes, there's, there's, do we have enough EP doctors to do all this? No. Um, probably if, if everyone wanted procedures, we wouldn't have enough CT surgeons to do it. But I think this is where technology is going to come in. You know, because if you can have a less invasive way, um, because I can go in vats and ligate someone's left atrial appendage, um, but there's really not a, there, they, there are some clips commercially available, but there's not a really easy way to do that. Um, you know, but as I think the technology evolves and it becomes less invasive, you know, we may someday have a very good and efficient way to do this through a sub xiphoid minimally invasive approach and ablate things through the pericardium. Um, and there are techniques available that, that can do that. But I think that the technology needs to get to a position where we can do that more efficiently. Um, and then, then you can start offering and safely and, and, and with equivalent results, then you can start potentially offering it to more people. But I agree, there's probably not enough electrophysiologists in the United States to take care of, you know, the massive population of people in AFib. Um, and then I think you may start seeing people that are younger with AFib, you know, who are actually, they're probably more likely to get an ablation because they're young, they're healthy. Um, they're going to see their cardiologist. Uh, you, this may be a more common procedure. You know, you have AFib, you, you, you start your medicines, you don't convert on your own. We schedule it for a small, minimally invasive procedure, whether it's surgery, EP, some combination of the two, and you go home the next day, because that's going to be where I think you really, where I think we really need to see technology advance more to make these less invasive um, so we can make them more available. Now, if you're planning on doing an intraoperative ablation on somebody for whatever reason, what, if any, mapping do you need done beforehand? Are you good just on anatomic grounds or do you need EPS mapping? I mean, I think the beauty, the, the, the beauty of, you know, the, the maze procedure, we, you know, again, that, that's a procedure that has, oh, what is it, the Cox maze four? So that tells you that there were, you know, that, that's, that's not, that's a process. You know, it's like the Belgium yeah. mark four. There were three other before it. So I, I think that as our understanding, you know, and this is working with our cardiologists, is our understanding and ability to map out the area that's causing or that maybe the a focus of the arrhythmia or the pathways that need to be ablated. You know, if you're opening the mitral valve, very easy. I mean, that not very easy, but it, it's it's a standard way that you can approach it. Um, I think the bigger challenge is for folks that are getting, let's say, an aortic valve or just a coronary or isolated coronary surgery where you're not planning to open it. Um, and then, you know, probably pulmonary vein isolation and ligating the appendage, that's better than nothing. Um, uh, is it as good as, you know, maybe having the EP touch that up later? That might be even be better. So, 
you know, I, I think that, it, you know, it's going to be some kind of hybrid, truly heart, heart team approach uh, that's tailored for every patient because someone getting a mitral is a, very different than someone having isolated coronary surgery. Well, I, I think, I mean, I think that point you made needs to be underscored in that we have far too few people in yours and mine's line of work who want to try to tailor the solution to the patient's needs rather than bend the patient to what they're comfortable doing. Um, and I mean, and I get it, I mean, but having good teams and people like you that, you know, are really expert in their field that you can discuss this within the support, we really need that on all sorts of levels. And, you know, you and I have worked in some very sophisticated environments and some very austere environments, and there, there are ways to share information in both. I mean, certainly with the federal government's pocketbook, it's a little easier to have communication to places that are really remote than maybe the private sector is up to on any given day, but I think the concepts are the same, but we really need, I think the, the, one of the great values of, of the issue that you and your colleagues wrote to me is it gives everybody a really excellent base to know what questions to ask and to know that they need to talk to people about things. And if they do that before things begin, they're far less likely to get into a jam as the process goes along. Yeah. Um, so we thank what you if, for that. Yeah. One of the other things, if I can get a minute, is yeah, one sure. of the things that I really like that Dr. Hoff talked about that I think applies to all surgical disciplines is pacemakers. Um, you know, how many Please. times when you have a patient with a pacemaker that we just say, yeah, throw a magnet on it, it's going to be fine. But I really liked, and he, very specifically in a table, he showed you what it means when someone is DDD paced or VVD yeah. paced. And how to approach that and, and what the role of electrosurgical, where you put your grounding pad, because those are things that affects an orthopedic surgeon as much as it affects a cardiac surgeon or any, you know, X, Y, any surgeon using electrical energy. So I really think that that understanding, we should all have that base understanding, um, just like we should understand dual antiplatelet therapy. Well, I, th I think you're right. And I'm glad you brought it up. I'm, I'm sorry I didn't bring it up before, but I mean, just I can remember when I was involved as a junior resident with the first implantable cardio defibrillator in Maine. And like the news teams were there. We had this giant box with switches all over it. We were sewing these pads onto the heart that looked like fly swatters. I mean, yeah. it was unrecognizable compared to today's gear. But the, the principles are the same. It's like if you go back to the old computers that were working on tubes, and now you, you pick up your iPhone and you get more computing power than NASA had in that whole Apollo <laughs> program. You know, I mean, it's it's unrecognizable under the hood, but the basic principles are absolutely identical. And and that chapter is you or that section within it with the tables on dual ventricular pacing, what the sensing options are, what the delivery options are and how you address it. Some of the programming features that cannot be taken for granted. Not at all. <laughs> just basic electrosurgery. I mean, I, I challenged one of my residents the other day when we had a patient with a pacemaker. Um, I'm like, okay, where should we put the grounding pad? And then I asked, why do we put the grounding pad there? Where does the energy come from? Where does it actually go? And where does it go back to? I mean, that's a really basic thing that I think a lot of us take for granted um, that in our trainees may not know. I mean, how, how does electrosurgery work? And, you know, why should I put this pad away so that I can maybe draw current away from the box that's keeping that person alive when we're done? No, you're right. It's tough. And even just the concepts of monopolar versus bipolar, what does it mean to add blend or spray? And I mean, and I get it. If you really want to start getting into Fourier and Lorentz transformations and draw out the circuits, I mean, that's electrical engineering that most physicians didn't learn. Bovi happened to be a Mainer um, yeah. from my great home state. Um, so in Maine, you were, when if you trained there, you were forever beaten up on what the settings did in the Bovi machine. When you turn the knobs, what happened? It, yeah. It's gone away because everybody who knew forgot. But you're right. There's a handful of people out there that remember, but the practical aspects of it are there. And our anesthesia colleagues, the, like the whole team needs to get it. Yeah. OR nurses, but we, we as surgeons ought to be responsible. We shouldn't be just delegating that responsibility to somebody else to know that where the pads are, what kind of energy devices we're going to use, Although I, I do think there's a resurgence in interest in energy and closure devices and even clips. There seems to be yeah. a lot more bubbling around in the community about that than there was, say, maybe 10 or 15 years ago. I think robotics in part has driven that. Yeah, the, the bipolar set, yeah. Yeah, well, and, and even just 
people are trying, you know, they were trying to like, again, bend the patient to fix their closure device. Now they're trying to come up with clips and devices that are a little more specific for what they're doing, um, which is probably a good thing. It could be overdone, but I think it's probably a good thing. But no, you're right. That chapter on pacemakers, super critical and implantable defibrillators. I mean, everything's going to yeah. get implantable before long. Yes. Um, and we certainly, our orthopedic friends, you know, they're putting enough metal and hyperconductive elements into people that it changes the program too. I mean, people always worry about where the total hip is, and, you know, where the knee joint is, but they don't necessarily worry about where the pacemaker is. Yeah. And they should. Well, I'm glad you're asking the residents. They need you for that, as yeah. do we all. <laughs> um, anything else you want to bring? I mean, you know, there are certainly batches of other dysrhythmias to consider. Um, I think we as surgeons, and you correct me if I'm wrong, I think we've gotten a better handle on the volumetric issues we used to deal with and the stretch-related issues, not maybe completely, but at least somewhat. Um, but yeah. any other things you want to think about in terms of prevention uh, of dysrhythmias around the time of operations? No, but I think that, you know, the, the CHAD score is, is very helpful, you know, when you're considering someone for surgery that you may need to adjust their anticoagulation plan. Because, you know, if you have a low-risk uh, patient, it, it's perfectly fine to just stop their anticoagulation, especially for a high-risk case, and leave it stopped until you're out of that period of time. Um, so, you know, those, those scores, I think, are really there to help us, you know, you don't have to do all of this, you know, philosophical decision making, you know, you have some hard objective evidence that say this is safe. Um, you know, this patient is extremely high risk, I need to start them on anticoagulation as soon as possible, or in some cases, you know, may not discontinue it at all. So, um, depending on the procedure. So, you know, I, I just think that, you know, we see so many patients that have now devices that are on anticoagulants or antiarrhythmics, you know, we have to know as much about those as our internal medicine colleagues um, and have to do then interventions on people with those medicines on board. No, I'm with you. And I completely agree as I usually do with you. Um, okay. But anyways, I think that's about all I had to cover unless you want to throw anything else with, but just again, we can't thank you and the rest of the team enough for putting this stuff together. General surgeons and the rest of the surgical community really needs a place to turn to to get this information. And I think you've done a fantastic job as it's always. Oh, this. Thank you. It was an honor. I really appreciate it. Thank you for joining us for this surgical clinics podcast devoted to cardiothoracic surgery. The four articles discussed, as well as eight others, are in the June 2022 issue, volume 102, number three. The series is available for individual print or online subscriptions. Visit www.surgical.theclinics.com to subscribe. The series is also on the Elsevier digital platforms, Clinical Key and Science Direct. Be sure to follow us on Twitter at Surgical Clinics, and you can subscribe to the podcast through Apple, Google Play, Spotify, Stitcher, or Amazon Music. Thanks for listening.